Okay, troops, this is the second section in the electromagnetism unit in advanced higher physics. Um, we've already covered the electric field, so this is magnetic fields, and this will be the first lesson in this section. So, we've already met magnetic fields before. A magnetic field is a region in which a moving charge experiences a force, and the emphasis there is on the word moving. It has to have a velocity for it to experience a force. As I said, we've already met this in Unit 2, particles from space, when charged particles enter the Earth's magnetic field, maybe from the solar wind or from cosmic radiation. And there's the relationship we met in Unit 2. The force on a moving charged particle in a magnetic field is equal to Q, that's the charge, V, that's its velocity, and B is the magnetic induction, or the size of the magnetic field. We now need to look at the effect of placing a current carrying conductor in a uniform magnetic field. What happens then if we place a wire that's carrying a current in a magnetic field? Well, a current in a conductor is a flow of negative charges. These moving charges then will all experience the same force, because they're all moving in the same direction, they're all moving at the same speed, they've all got the same charge, they're all in the same magnetic field, so they will all experience the same force. Now let's think a wee bit about what current is. Remember from third year, we said that current is the rate of flow of charge, I equals Q over T. It's the number of coulombs per second that pass a point. If we rearrange that, Q equals I times T. And also, if we think about velocity, the speed of our moving charge, speed equals distance over time, and we can then change our relationship for the magnetic force on a single charge, Q, moving perpendicular to a magnetic field, to a relationship for the force that's acting on a current in a conductor of length L placed perpendicular to a magnetic field. Let's start off with F equals QVB. Then we're going to substitute in for Q, and we're going to substitute in for V. Let's see what we get. So if F equals QVB, Q is equal to IT. The speed of the charges, that's the length of the conductor in the field divided by the time it takes to go through the field, times our magnetic induction. Now, those two T's will cancel out, and we're left with F equals I L. B. Sometimes it's rearranged and it's written as F equals B I L or F equals Bill. B is the size of your magnetic field or the magnetic induction. I is the current and L is the length of the conductor in the field. Now it's perpendicular to the field. It's at 90 degrees to the field lines. So we can extend that relationship to include a conductor placed at any angle in a uniform magnetic field. When it's at 90 degrees, then sine theta will be equal to sine 90, which is 1. So F equals BIL is at a maximum when the conductor's perpendicular to the magnetic field. We can use our right-hand rule, remember. If we know what that current is, and we know what the size of the field is and the length of the conductor that's in the field, we can calculate the force that's acting on that conductor. So the right-hand rule will allow us to determine the direction of that force. And in this case, in that diagram, the wire will move upwards, perpendicular to the field. Because your field runs from north to south, your current is flowing from negative to positive. Right-hand rule for electron flow. Now, interestingly enough, this is the way the Tesla, the unit of magnetic induction, is defined. It's using this relationship. So the Tesla is the unit for magnetic induction, and one Tesla is defined as, now, you don't really need to know this in words, but by looking at the relationship, you should be able to see this. One Tesla is the magnetic induction that would produce a force of one newton on a current carrying conductor of length one meter, carrying a current of one amp, placed perpendicular to the magnetic field. It's a bit of a mouthful. 
But if we look at the relationship, if we rearrange this relationship to get b on its own and the theta is 90, so sine 90 is 1, then we rearrange that, we're going to get b equals f over il. So to get one Tesla, to get a magnetic induction of one Tesla, that means the force will be one Newton and the current is one amp and the length is one meter. All those quantities are equal to one. So one Tesla is equivalent to one Newton per amp per meter. There you go. Now we're going to do a little demo then, a little experiment to see if we can establish the relationship between the current and the force on a conductor placed in a uniform magnetic field. And you might have a little hypothesis here. You might think the bigger the current, then the faster the charges are moving. Uh, so therefore the bigger the magnetic force that's acting on them. So here's the experiment that we're going to do to uh, try and establish this relationship. We're going to get a piece of stiff copper wire, place it between two permanent magnets, which are sitting on an electronic Newton balance. We're going to pass a current through the wire and we're going to arrange it so that that conductor experiences an upwards force. That then will produce an equal and opposite force on the magnets downwards because although it's a piece of stiff copper wire, we're going to arrange it so the wire doesn't move. So therefore the upwards force on it will be balanced by a downwards force that's going to force the magnets down onto the balance and we'll get a reading on the balance. And that force can be measured. It will be in grams, but we can convert it into newtons. And we will measure our current with an ammeter. We'll also measure the length of the conductor that's in the field. And we'll draw a graph of the current in the conductor against the force reading that we get from the balance. And the gradient of the graph that we're going to draw will be force on the y-axis against I on the x-axis. And from that gradient and the length of the conductor in the field, we should be able to determine the size of the magnetic field. Let's go then. OK, everybody. We're doing this wee experiment here about the force on a conductor placed in a uniform magnetic field. So here it is set up. And what we're going to try and do in this experiment is we're going to try and establish the relationship between the current that's passing through a conductor. Now I've got a little piece of stiff copper wire there. That stiff copper wire is being held up by a couple of clamp stands and it's suspended between those two magnets. There's a uniform magnetic field between those two magnets that are held in that little yoke and that little yoke is sitting on a digital electronic balance measuring in grams at the moment. Now, the wire is not connected in any shape or form to those magnets. The wire is not sitting on the electronic balance. The wire is being suspended by these clamp stands. And the wire is stationary. It's not moving. So if it's not moving, then forces are balanced. The weight of the wire is being supported by the clamp stands. Now, I'm going to pass a current through that wire because the wire is connected with some crop clips to a variable resistor and a switch and a 6 volt battery and an ammeter. And when we pass a current through that stiff copper wire, then that copper wire, that conductor that's placed in a magnetic field, it should experience a force. Now that conductor will either experience a force upwards or downwards. Remember the force on the conductor is perpendicular to the field. So the field lines are running horizontally between the magnets. So the force on that conductor will be either vertically up or vertically down. Which means we'll get a reading on the balance. Either a positive or a negative reading on the balance. But what we want to see is how does the size of the current affect the size of the reading on the balance. So here's what we're going to do then. Here's our aim. Here's the kind of setup. We've got a stiff copper wire between two magnets. 
if copper wires connected with a variable resistor and an ammeter to a 6 volt battery pack. And so that stiff copper wire is suspended in the uniform magnetic field and we're going to pass a current through it. And note the reading on the balance. There's our aim to establish the relationship between the current and the force on the conductor in the magnetic field. Now the balance is reading in grams, but we'll change that into newtons just by using W equals mg. And hopefully we will be able to see how the current affects the force on the conductor in the magnetic field. It was reading zero to start with because we've got no current. I'm going to switch it on and arrange my current so that it's maybe at half an amp. We're going to use the 5 amp scale. We're going to use the 5 amp scale so that is the bottom scale on my analog ammeter here. So let's switch on and I am going to change my variable resistor until the current is about half an amp bottom scale. Okay, I'm at half an amp and I'm getting a reading on my balance of 0.13 grams. Okay, got that in my table. And now we're going to increase the current by moving the variable resistor and that current will increase up to 1 amp. Bottom scale, remember, using a 5 amp shunt. So, 1 amp and we're getting a current, sorry, a current of 1 amp and we're getting 0.26 grams on the balance. That's looking good so far because we doubled the current and we got double the reading on the balance. We're now going to go up to one and a half amps. If I can. One and a half amps and we're getting 0 0.39 grams. Okay, last one. We change that variable resistor. We get a current of 2 amps and a reading on a balance of 0.52 grams. And I'm going to stop it there because that is as much current as I can get from that 6 volt battery pack. So my last reading then, when that was 2 amps, we got 0 0.52. And let's take those results then and see if we can plot a graph and see if there's a relationship between the current in a conductor and the force on that conductor when it's placed in a uniform magnetic field. Now, if you want a little bit of practice at drawing graphs either by hand or using Excel, here are my results. I've changed the gram readings on the balance into newtons by multiplying by 9.8 and if you are drawing a graph of this, put current on the x-axis and force on the y-axis and see if you can work out the gradient of the graph. Then using the gradient and the length of the wire in the field, you should be able to determine the magnetic induction. Okay, so pause the video if you want to do that um, and then I will come back and I will show you my graph. Right, I've put my results into Excel. I've got all my current readings in the first column there and I took all the electronic balance gram readings and I changed them into newtons using W equals mg and all my forces there are measured in times 10 to the minus 3 newtons and then we plotted a graph of force on the y-axis against current on the x-axis Right, let's get back onto the PowerPoint then there's our results table current and amps force in times 10 to the minus 3 newtons and we plotted a graph. Bear in mind the length of the wire in the field I measure to be 50 millimetres. In fact it's the magnets that are 50 millimetres long. So the length of copper that's in the magnetic field must be 50 millimetres. And there's that graph. I asked Excel to show the equation of the line y equals mx plus c and the gradient is 2.54 times 10 to the minus 3 because my y-axis is in units of times 10 to the minus 3 newtons. Now we can use that gradient to determine the size of the magnetic field, the magnetic induction that was producing the magnetic force. It's a direct relationship between the force and the current. So, 
the force varies directly with the current in the conductor, taking into consideration that very small systematic uncertainty. So therefore, F varies directly with I. If we look at our relationship, B equals F over I times L. Then, if we substitute in F over I, that's the gradient of 2.54 times 10 to minus 3, multiply that by 1 over the length of the wire that was in the field, 50 millimetres, 50 times 10 to minus 3, it gives us a magnetic induction of 51 times 10 to minus 3 Tesla, and I googled the size of these school magnets that we use, and the manufacturer tells us that they produce a field when in the yoke that I was using of 50 milli Tesla, so that's pretty good. Now you might be wondering how is it that we get a reading on the electronic balance? Well, remember the stiff copper wire is experiencing a force. Now I have got this arranged so that the magnetic field, which points from north to south, is pointing from left to right. So if I use my right hand rule here, my magnetic field is pointing from left to right. The current flowing through the conductor is flowing from front to back, from the uh, from the front of the screen into the screen if you like. So if I use my right hand rule, my first finger points from left to right, my second finger points into the screen, my thumbs pointing upwards, so the conductor experiences a force upwards, but that conductor's not moving, it's still stationary, so it must be exerting an equal and opposite force downwards, and it's pushing the yoke, it's pushing the magnets down onto the electronic balance, and it's that downwards force that's the reaction to the upwards force that produces the reading on the balance. So there you go then, that's a demonstration to show you the relationship between the current in a current carrying conductor and the force on that conductor when it's placed in a uniform magnetic field. And we discover that there's a direct relationship between the current and the force on the conductor as long as we keep the length of the conductor, the orientation of the conductor and the size of the magnetic field the same. There you go then, see you in the next one.